I'd like to welcome everybody to our second day of uh, CS Research Week, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Jean Ponce. He's from ENS uh, PSL in Paris, as well as a global distinguished professor at the current Institute of Mathematics at uh, New York University and the Center for Data Science. Um, so before his positions at ENS and also NYU, uh, Professor Ponce has also had positions in INRIA, MIT, Stanford, UIUC, so he has a long list of uh, illustrious institutions <laughs> in his uh, CV. And uh, more interestingly, actually, uh, maybe Kim Hee and the others who work in computer vision know this also. Uh, Professor Ponce is also the author of uh, a very well-known computer vision textbook, uh, Computer Vision, Modern Approach. I'm still waiting for the updated version, actually. <laughs> you, may, you may have to wait a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so and this book has been translated in many languages and is used as part of uh, computer vision education as well. And more recently, I was uh, pleased to find out this past summer also <laughs> that he's uh, co-founded a startup and is now CEO of Enhance Lab. And so I think maybe he will describe some of the ventures here in today's talk as well, where they're developing software for uh, image enhancement. So demosaicing, denoising, super resolution, as well as HDR imaging. So without further ado, I'd like to give the stage and let's give a warm welcome to uh, Professor Ponce. Thank you very much, Angela. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's been great and I um, hope you enjoyed the talk. It's, uh, it's work I've been doing with a whole bunch of people. My students are listed first and then my collaborators later. And of course, it's the students who do most of the work. So I have, um, I have too many slides. So if, if you see I'm running out of time, just stop me. All right, so um, here is my view of vision today. It's exaggerated, it's, it's, so don't take it very seriously. But, but sometimes I get the feeling that all we spend our time doing is trying to get 0.2% you know, better on whatever, on this not image net anymore, but it's something else. Uh, on these, these exotic uh, data, data sets and benchmarks that are not always related to real problems. Sometimes also we try to make pretty pictures and all that, and, and, and more and more, we took uh, neural networks, whatever, whether they are transformers, CNNs, or something more exotic, as some magic black box. We press the button, and then there are easy libraries to use, and we hope for the best. So again, this is an exaggerated view. Uh, but I think it reflects a little bit reality. So what I believe in is that we, and what I've been looking at in the last couple of years, is that we should look at real problems in both engineering and in uh, sciences in sciences is kind of cool. So I will try to, to describe that uh, through uh, work and uh, photography, including the, through the startup I talk about, and through astronomy, through collaboration with astronomers uh, in, in Paris and Europe. <coughs> um, and I believe personally that um, we should, I, I'm not a big fan of black boxes, whatever their charm may be, and I'm a believer in the models, and so in, in, in this kind of, of problems, we, we have pretty good models of what's happening. We have pretty good physical models, so I think we should use them because we will simplify our task. If I have time, I will talk about something that's quite unrelated, uh, but I think it's pretty nice as well. It's worth the next student of mine, Guillaume Lemoin, in collaboration with Cordelia Schmidt on video. Uh, predicting the future and, and tracking points, so we'll see if we have time. And if I had even more time, I would talk about theoretical work in robotics, but I'm sure I won't have time. But if I get there, who knows? All right. So first, I'm going to talk about image restoration. So if you, if you look, for example, at, uh, at the telephone, uh, the camera inside is the cameras inside. I only have two, but now you can have three, four, five cameras on your phone are excellent. They, they deliver wonderful pictures with wonderful software to improve them. Uh, but they are still imperfect. So even though they have very high resolution, people like to zoom in to look at the grandmother that they missed when they, well, that suspect because they wanted to get the Eiffel Tower full in the picture. Um, and if you zoom, 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 of course, eventually we'll run out of resolution. And so can, you, can we improve that? Um, they typically have further poor dynamic range. So if you take this picture, in the, in the light areas, like the sky, the sky is not blue, it's white, and in the dark areas, you don't see anything. So can we do something about it? And of course, even though the, the, the sensors have an excellent quality, in low light of short exposure, the images will be noisy. And the solution cannot be purely a hardware solution because the space you have in a smartphone is limited. 
You can put you cannot put sensor this big, you cannot put a lens that big, it's small. Okay, so the solution has to be at least in part software. And I believe that this is an excellent uh, domain to uh, to apply uh, ideas from uh, machine machine learning, computer vision, signal processing. So I'm not a machine learning person. I collaborate with machine learning people. Um, and why is it a good uh, domain for that? Is because we typically have both in image restoration and in scientific imaging, astronomy or microscopy, we typically have very faithful models of the physical image formation process that we can use. So in this case, for example, you have an operator A, whatever. I don't see the thing, doesn't matter. And this operator A is, is some sort of local corruption of the image and it could be, for example, uh, some blur, okay? Uh, we also can exploit uh, well-known properties of natural images, such as self-similarities. Within an image, often you'll have bits that look like each other, and sparsity, and we already talked about sparsity yesterday. I will come back to that, to that in a bit. It's also easy to generate uh, realistic training data because we have these models. Okay, so it's pretty good for doing uh, for doing uh, supervised machine learning. On the other hand. What we are do looking at is uh, solving inverse problems. So far, people have been working on that for decades, and so they have proven technologies to solve these inverse problems. So we can mix the physical uh, models, the inverse problem technology, and the uh, machine learning stuff all together to get the best of all world. And finally, because we have this, for example, iterative optimization algorithm, the architecture that we get in the end is more or less interpretable. It has kind of functional nature and having this block diagram thing, okay? Uh, on the other hand, there's a difficulty, is that in general we don't have ground truth because a, a, a camera doesn't deliver both a high and a low resolution image, okay? Or in astronomy, uh, we don't know where the exoplanets we are looking at, uh, we are looking for are. Okay, so we have, to, we have to be able to, to deal with those problems, which makes them interesting. So I'm going, I'm going to, to talk about image processing a bit, so if there are really image pro real image processing people here, I hope I don't offend anyone. I've never taken additional processing class in my class in my life. I'm naive about that, but I'll try to talk about some pertinent work. So think of the problem of denoising an image. So you take an image at night, there's plenty of noise, so do you remove it? The simplest method is you take each pixel and you average it with its neighbors. What will happen if you do that? Well, you will remove the noise, but uh, you will blur the image, okay? So in 2005, Buades and his colleagues came up with a very simple but excellent idea, which is called non-local means. Instead of, I really don't see them. Instead of averaging the pixel with, with its neighbors, you take other pixels, or rather other patches in the images that look like it, and you average it with those patches that look like it. And because they look like the, the pixel or the patch you're interested in, it will do less blurring. And this has turned out to be an extremely powerful image, um, powerful ID, and very successful image processing. There's a different ID that has been around since. Uh, at least also and, and field, so that's neuroscience in the 90s, is the idea of sparsity. We have shown, we have, people have shown over and over again that natural images can be decomposed in some kind of linear family of, uh, of objects in a sparse manner. That means that a patch will be represented as a linear combination of previously uh, uh, selected patches, but with the, the constraints that some of the coefficients are, are, are zero, a lot of the coefficients are zero. So this, this came for the neuroscience, but it has also been used in, uh, in vision and in image processing since the 90s. The way you write it is that uh, you are going to have a dictionary element or atoms, and you take a linear combination of them to approximate a patch, and you insist that most of these coefficients are zero, which you often write as the fact that the pseudonorm L0, that counts the number of non-zero equations, is small or limited, okay? And then you say, well, all the energy, all the, all the content of the image will be this non-zero coefficient, and the, the noise will be in the rest, and we'll have a denoise image, okay? So there's another very influential paper uh, that came out in 2007 by the Tempere group with uh, an operator for denoising called BM3D. It does two things. It takes ID from sparse representations, 
and it takes ID from the local means. So you take, you pick patches in the images that look like each other, you stack them, and then you decompose them on a 3D cosine transform basis, and then you return the top coefficients, and that's all. And because you do this with um, patches that look each other, you are going to use all the benefits of non-local means. You are going to get excellent results. And in fact, this thing was very, very hard to beat until the mid 2000s, even though there was no machine learning involved whatsoever. And third approach is instead of taking uh, a dictionary that, that is predefined, such as this cosine transform, what you can do is try to learn a dictionary adapted to the task. So what you want to do is, given some patches that you observe that are, that are uh, corrupted, you want to decompose them on the dictionary, and you want you add a penalty that's going to enforce sparsity. So ideally, we like to have the L0 to so the norm penalty, but it turns out that the corresponding optimization problem is difficult, whereas if you replace it by the L1 norm regularizer, then it will induce sparsity as well, but you have a convex problem. Okay? And instead of minimizing just, so you take a bunch of patches, instead of just minimizing respect to the codes, you also minimize respect to dictionary. And this is a method that was introduced first by uh, Elad and Aaron in 2006, and proved a bit upon by Julien Meral later. And you can finally take this, this ID, and combine it with non-local means. So what you do is you are going to say, I'm going to take a bunch, so a patch here is a colony in that matrix. So I'm, to, I'm going to take a bunch of patches that look like each other, and I'm going to insist that their codes, their codes have zero in the same rows. Okay? So they have the same structure. The codes are not the same, but they have the same structure. They will have zeros, non-zero in the same rows. How do you do that? You just change the regularizer, replacing the L1 regularizer by so-called L12 regularizer, which is the sum of the L2 norms of the rows. And because we know that the L1 regularizers enforce sparsity, this will enforce sparsity on the norm of the two rows. That means it will force entire rows to be zero. And that's something that Julien Meral did for his thesis. And this gives very good results. So those are typical image processing uh, data sets. You take an image, you add uh, um, white noise, and, uh, and then you try to remove it. And I don't know if you can see it, but you can actually recover the brick structure in the house. And it's not perfect. Uh, there are some artifacts. The, the, the face of the guy looks a little bit uh, rectangular, but it, it's pretty good. And it beats BM3D. Okay, so all that to say that you have this family of methods, when you can put them together, you can get interesting things. So this, this kind of examples where you put Gaussian noise in an image, eh, that's not so good, because real noise is not like that. So there are good models for noise in, in uh, cameras. There's one, again, by the Tempere team. It's a, it's a Gaussian noise that, that it was, um, standard deviation is um, signal dependent. Okay? And you can, you can compute or, or estimate the parameters of this noise model from data relatively easily. Okay? So depending on uh, of the, the intensity of your pixel, the, no the noise value will be different. Okay? And with this, you can do a lot of things. Um, caveat, this model is only good for raw images. And what, we, what your camera delivers in not raw images, I will come back to that in a second. Okay? But you have these good models that are are useful. And so you can try on real images with real noise and see how this, this, this different method works. I, I, you know, whether, I'm not sure which one works better. But it's in, in this image processing thing, you have two ways of evaluating things. One is you compute errors, you compute so-called PSNR, or you look with your eyes, because in the end, what you want is image quality that, is, that people like. All right. So that was imaginizing. I want to do a small detour. Um, you probably know that a very uh, successful approach to, uh, to machine learning recently has been uh, transformers. And one of the key elements of transformers is that they use so-called self-attention modules. And the way it's expressed in the original paper by Svenny et al, it is that you have queries, matrices, and uh, whatever they are called, and blah, blah, blah. What they do, in fact, is that in a transformer, the data is organized in successive rows like that. Each row is a pixel, a patch, a token, can be a word or a patch in an image. And what this self-attention thing, what it does, it replaces each row 
in this image, but a linear combination of the other rows weighted by learned affinities. And this is exactly what non-local means does. Except in non-local means, typically, you don't have learned affinities. Okay? So to me, I'm naive, but to me, this is one of the reasons why transformers are so successful. Oops, I'm going the wrong way, sorry. All right. So now let's go back to the, the thing that, that we are really working on. This is kind of background, which is uh, image super resolution. We, want, we have low resolution image or several low resolution images like this, and we want to reconstruct images with a higher spatial resolution. Okay? This example is from Dal, Dal et al. in 2017. And it's pretty impressive because me, I don't see anything here, and you get nice faces. Okay? So does it work? What can we do about it? Um, so people have been working on this single image. So you take a single image in that case, and you improve its resolution. People have been working on that problem for a while. One of the nice papers about it, I think, is one by uh, Glasner et al. in, in uh, 2009. And the idea is that you are going to exploit self-similarities in an image. So of course, in this, Im this particular image, there's a lot of self-similarities. It has been, been built for that. but. So if you take this patch here, it's similar to all the patches there. So how, do you, how can you help that? And it's an idea that uh, Michael Irani, the, the senior author, has been pushing for a long time. How can you use it? Well, if H is your high resolution image that you don't know, L is your low resolution image, then for each pixel that you see, you are going to have the high resolution image convolved with the uh, a blurring operator corresponding to a change in resolution. So each pixel that you are going to have is going to give you a linear constraint in the high-resolution image. And what you do in this case is, instead of just doing this, when you find other patches that look like the patches you're interested in, you are going to add, add them to the constraint. So you use the internal consistency of the image to try to improve the reconstruction. And this works quite well. So this is the low resolution picture of a baby, and this is the high resolution. The, you see there's quite a bit more detail. The mouth is very well reconstructed and all that, even the eyes. If you, well, that doesn't matter. If you look closer, you will see that the eye is kind of squarish, but still this gives very good results. Okay, but of course today we live in the era of uh, generative AI where you have these two cool things. Uh, that's daily and imagine, but there are, there are plenty of others. You, you, uh, you, you put in some sentence, you crank a machine with an LLM inside and some, some diffusion model inside, and you take these nice pictures. So maybe you can use this kind of ideas to get super resolution. In fact, people have. So the example I showed you today, um, a couple of minutes ago, by Dal et al. doesn't choose diffusion, but it's this kind of idea. Okay, it's using GANs. And as you can see from the original picture, you get things that are quite realistic. But if you look at the ground truth, the true image that the low resolution images were generated from, it's not the same people. It's not there. I mean, look at the, the woman on top. I don't think it's the same person. It's not, it's, there's nothing wrong about it. There's just not enough information in a single image to reconstruct the right person. So people have built on that. The, so those are. I don't have the diffusion examples, but those are more recent things. So low resolution image, by cubic, uh, whatever this, this method. And you can see that you get higher and higher resolution doing time set. Super resolution is a little bit crazy. The 60 times, 64 times as many pixels. But you know, this is very impressive. And we can even go further, time 64. OK? And it's very realistic. But again, the person has changed between row number four and row number five. Why? There's just not enough information. And actually, the guys who wrote that paper, they are totally aware of that. They, they warn you that you know, this shouldn't be taken as a, as a as truth that you can use in, in an engineering application. This should be seen as more of a game of what you can do that, that's really nice. They are totally aware of that. They are, they are very smart people, of course. So <clears throat> can you do better? And, and and really, can you tell who is whom from a low-resolution image like that? So here is a low-resolution image. Here are some old people from the computer vision machine learning community. And which one is it? Do you know? 
Ja, det är det. Ja, det är det. Och så med det här så. Jag vet inte, tänk på det. Also, I can give you a perf an algorithm that will give you every single time a perfectly realistic image. What's the algorithm? You give me an image, and you give me a bag with full of uh, photographs of faces. I take this image, and I go in my bag, and I pick a random image to be fully, uh, fully, uh, fully realistic. So we must do better. And so the way to do better is to actually uh, use multiple images, where the, the The information is there from the start. So the person that, that we had here was none of the, 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 the three old guys is this, this general. And if you do use multiple pictures, what you will recover is this in the middle. And to me, this in the middle looks like the right person. Maybe I'm wrong. All right. So people have been working on multi-image super resolution for a long time. Uh, some of the, the key papers, like uh, Michael Irani and Shmuel Peleg in 1991, Tsai and Wang in, uh, in 84. Um, the result don't look so great. Part of it is because it's bad, bad uh, reproduction of the original image in the, when they were Xeroxed to, to get the thing. Yeah? Uh, but the idea is that when you, you take a sequence of pictures, the camera will move a bit. And as you move a bit, you will have redundant information. Is redundant information, you can use to reconstruct the image. People, even er, relatively early in 2002, people have used the fact, for example, that you had faces to get better recognition, which is what the machine learning techniques do. They have seen a lot of faces. They hallucinate reasonable face details. And actually, so Baker and Canadé, they wrote this paper called Reconstruction, or Hallucination Reconstruction, where they use the fact that we know we have looked at lots of faces to reconstruct a much better face model from a given image than using other methods. But we don't want to do that here. What we want to do is get the real stuff. You know or you don't know that your, your camera doesn't capture three colors at every pixels. It only captures one, R, G, or B. Okay? You have a, a filter array in front of your pixel, so either it sees the, the blue channel, the green channel, or the red channel. You can, of course, the, the thing that your camera delivers is a, is a JPEG image based on so-called sRGB picture that has a free channel set each pixel. But this, the, the process of creating the, this picture is itself an interpolation process. It's very similar to super resolution. And so if you start from the JPEG image, you will have lost information. It's better to start from the raw image. And the fact that you have multiple images, of course, will be better. One additional uh, advantage of starting from the raw images is that normally, so this process going from raw to RGB is called demosaicing. So you invent the missing information by interpolation. But when you have small motion of the camera, each pixel of your the synthesized image may actually see several RG and B components. So you can reconstruct the true color without doing demosaicing. And it's an idea that was at least the first time I saw it was in a paper by Bronsky et al. And this helps with the mosaicing, but also with, with, with denoising. This is an example. This is um, the JPEG image that, that uh, a camera gives a small close-up um, of, of a big image. And there are uh, aliasing, uh, aliasing artifacts. And you have these yellow bands. And you also have these funny, funny patterns that don't look quite right. If you use a burst, You get rid of the yellow bands, and you get the right patterns. Okay, so I'm now going to show you. Oh yeah, I'm going to show you a bunch of methods for doing that. I'm not going to show you any table. I, I love columns of numbers like everybody else, but I'm not going to show you that. You, I hope you will forgive me. And of course, I'm not the only one to do that. Many people do that as well. Okay. So this is the, 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 the method by Ronsky et al. So it, it, it's something that's used in Google Pixel. Uh, and the idea is very, very simple. You, you take the, the raw image burst. You align the images using so-called lucas Kennedy algorithm. I'll come back to lucas Kennedy in a bit. Um, and then you combine the channels using some filtering where the, 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 the shape and the orientation of filters depend on the data. So for example, the filters are aligned with the edges. Okay? And then if you do that, 
you can get this kind of result. So this is this is one scale. This is computing method based, I think, on deep learning, and uh, and I don't think that the low resolution image is there somewhere. It's difficult to see the difference. So let's zoom a bit, and you can see that this was quite wrong. Okay. All right. Another way to do it is to say it, I'm going to solve an inverse problem, and I'm going to solve it by writing a regularized least square problems. Okay. So first, you model image formation. The image formation, there will be a bunch of things. So you have some high-resolution image you don't know. You have some low-resolution you observe, and you want to be able to predict to a forward model uh, y from x. What do you do? Well, you are going to have to account by the small motions of your, of your, of your camera. And before I forget, the way, the way typically you do it is you, your smartphone can capture a burst of images, 5, 10, 20, 30 images. And, and as you tremble a little bit naturally, in my case, tremble a lot, you will get redundant information. So you need to align. Once you have aligned, you resample everything in the same grid. And then you need to take into account the fact that as you go to a coarser resolution, of course, you are going to blur your signal by integrating over the big pixel. Okay, so W is the geometric transformation, B is the blur that is fixed, and D is a decimation operator that's going to pick one of the pixels. And so you have, the, um, this is your corruption operator that's parameterized by the, by the warp, and you, you see you have K images, and there are, there are instances of this guy corrupted by this, plus some noise, and again, the noise you can model. And so how do you recover X? Well, you minimize the discrepancy with the data that you have, and of course you regularize. That's the typical way you do, um, you, do uh, you solve inverse problem. So this is an example, an example by Batteal. Those are the people at ETH who work closely with um, uh, Huawei. Uh, and so what do they do? They look at the, they look at the original regular square problem and they, they introduce a bit, a bit of learning. So what kind of learning do they use? They put an encoder to encode the, the raw image patches. They put, uh, they, they, they make the forward model learnable. They use additional parameters to a forward model. They use a latent variable. They are not going to recover directly the image, but some latent variable. And then from the latent variable, they use a learnable decoder to get the, the final image. And then, you write the optimization problem to recover the, um, the, the latent variable from your data, and you learn the parameters that have to be learned in a supervised way from synthetic images. Uh, so you take a real image, and then you corrupt it. And so it's semi-synthetic image. And you have to be a bit careful in the way you do it, because you have to have in, in, inject noise that's uh, reasonable. You have to do it everything the, the, the right way, but there are methods for doing that. So you train the thing, and then you get good results. Here are some examples, close-ups of, uh, of, uh, of images. Um, we did it a slightly different way. So this was from Bruno, Bruno Lequat, um, a PhD thesis. We take the regularized least squares problem. We don't introduce all these learnable thingies that were not there. We just take the plain image formation model. But what we are going to do is make the regularizer learnable. And then we learn the parameters in a supervised way. How do you how do you optimize that stuff? So what we do is we use a well-known method in, for this kind of inverse problem. It's called a quadratic penalty or a quadratic splitting method, where you introduce a new variable z. It's an auxiliary variable with respect to which the optimization is going to be very simple because it's a linear least squares problem. And so the key thing is to solve the, 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 the second minimum. And also, you want to learn the parameters. So what you do is you decompose it in successive step, estimate z. So z is, uh, is uh, again, a linear least squares problem. Uh, we are going to do it by steps of gradient descent. Estimate the warp. We are going to use it using a nonlinear least square, Gauss Newton. Estimate x. This is a proximal update. So you have the proximal operator associated with your regularizer. Okay? And what we are going to do is we are going to unroll a few steps of this algorithm. So you have a finite step, a finite number of iterations. Each step is going to be differentiable, and you can, uh, you can differentiate to respect to the learnable parameter and learn these parameters. 
In fact, because you are going to iterate, you don't need to optimize to def, say, Gauss Newton. And the proximal operator for a given uh, regularizer is difficult to find, so we use a very simple method called plug and play. Ah, you see, the proximal operator is a CNN. Okay? And then you optimize that. And the idea of unrolling a few iterations of, uh, of, um, of uh, iterative algorithm goes back to Gregor and, and the kind of years back. All right. Yes? It's a unit, yeah. yeah. Um, so here are some examples. So I put the pictures in black and white because the raw pictures are, are not in color and I did not know how to visualize them. So these are, this is a burst of, I think, 20 images taken by Lumix. So Lumix is not a smartphone, it's a good camera. It outputs 20 megapixel images. And what you are going to do is reconstruct the higher resolution images. So this is a crop of, of a burst, again, about 20 images. As you can see, it's a small crop. It, it moves quite a bit. This is short exposure. This, the image is very noisy, and you can't read the text. On the right is what we recover. You can read the text. The noise is gone. I don't know if you can see the little grid things here. This is real. OK? Here is another example. It's a close-up of the picture you saw before. Again, noisy, l'auditeur. That's what we recover. Is another one, that's my favorite one. Uh, Bruno thinks it's creepy because apparently it creeps people out to see. Uh, that, that, I have no idea why, but see the origin, one of the original images. And what to recover? The hair is real. The details in the cloth are real. It's not perfect, a little bit of chromatic aberration. Yeah. That's it, pretty good. You start from this. And the best thing about it is the animation to have the slider. It took me hours to do these things. But <laughs> if you want, I will tell you how to do it. Um, here's an example. This is Julia Merald, my, 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 my colleague and, and her rabbit, uh, daughter and her rabbit. And that's a close-up of the eye of the rabbit. And you can, I don't know if you can see, but you can actually see the room in the pupil of the, of the rabbit. And why did we take that picture? Well, we are t working with people who are interested in cosmetology and dermatology and things like lashes and all that. They care about that. This is another example. This is a, a picture taken again with the Lumix uh, in Spain at night. And uh, this is a small crop. And th there are some, I don't know if you can see them, but there are some like purplish uh, stains in the thing. And of course, it's low resolution, it's noisy. And this is what you get. Okay, and again, these, re these details are not invented, they are recovered. All right, um, so that's where we stood at the end of 21. There's plenty of improvements in respect to the end of 21, but then we thought, what about trying to improve not only the spatial resolution, but the dynamic range? So that, at na yes? No, 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 you train it on... Uh, Yeah. No, no, so it's, it's, the, it's the beauty of plug and play. You don't know anything, you try it and uh, it's supervised. It's, it, yeah, it's, 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 a, and, and, and it's not clear at all the C, whether it's unit or the CNN will be the proximal operator of anything. In general, I think it's not. So, yeah. um, so we wanted to do, uh, to improve the, the dynamic range, for example, for, for night images. Um, and those are real pictures taken by, uh, by Pixel 3 or something of Notre Dame. Uh, the text is not readable. You have saturated parts and, and, and parts in the dark. Uh, the way we do it is very simple, same as before, the learnable regularizer, forward model. We have added some weights, and the forward model now includes the fact that we vary the exposure time during the, the sequence. Okay? And the weights. It's very simple. There is going to be a mask that tells you if the pixel is saturated. You see if you know, the value is 255, if you want. You are going to have a learnable predictor because it's a bit more challenging, and then you learn it the same way as before. There is another example. This is the recovered image. It's the, it's the Louvre as well, I think, at night. And if you look at the, the close-up of this, none of the images is well exposed. The, the, the dark ones are very noisy. You don't see anything. The bright ones are totally saturated. 
And this is what you get, which is you know, not bad. My favorite example is this one. This is um, in Bruno's uh, office at night. So he's facing the spot. And so uh, none of the pictures is good. On the right, I've put close-ups of, of these four windows in the middle image that a priori should be the better exposed. But of course, it's not well exposed either. Okay? And uh, this is what you get. So for example, you can see Bruno taking himself in a picture in the window. You can see very well in the neighbor's house the shape of the chair. And you can see that the, his trackpad is disgusting. And if you wrinkle your eyes, maybe you can read what he has written. And you see that. Uh, OK. All right, so in, for real applications for photography, uh, you want these things to be robust. Uh, in particular, it assumes that you are, you are looking at a rigid scene, but in real scenes, people will be moving around. So this is a close-up of, a, um, of a, a large urban scene, but somebody is running. And so um, this is comparison with some other methods. And when the model doesn't work for the deep, purely deep learning-based methods, you are going to get a big splash big ugly thing where you have, uh, where, you have the, the, where the model doesn't work. And we have, we have managed to be relatively uh, robust to this. And again, it's important because no user will use something that puts ugly stuff in their, in, in their pictures. Um, the typical way of comparing, there are benchmarks and you compare the PSNR. Because this is synthetic data, this is not always particularly meaningful. Again, looking, looking at it with your eyes is a good thing. You can also look at the at the, com the computational post, because we have a, a big image formation part, the neural net is small, and so the memory and calculation cost is small, and we're actually porting it on um, smartphones right now as we speak. Um, we want to do more stuff. You can calibrate uh, lenses now. So this is a, a close-up, a small crop of a picture taken by a Canon 5D, I think it's a DSLR camera, professional, with a very good lens. And it's, and it's in focus. But the lens is not designed to crop, 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 crop. So you have, you have uh, chromatic aberrations. You have red stuff here, and it's fuzzy. But you can calibrate the, the lens to death. You know, cal compute this PSF, inverse the PSF. And you sharpen, you de-blur a sharp picture. And at the same time, you remove most of the chromatic aberrations. Uh, we are also, even though you have to hallucinate, we're also working a bit on a single image uh, super resolution. So this is Julian's cat, low resolution image, full burst super resolution, single image burst. If you zoom further, you can see there's some imagining there, but the result is not so bad. Um, one of the things we want to do is, at some point, we want to be able to remove uh, before I tell you that, this is the competition. This is us. They look about the same, but if you look at some point, you will see that the, the ground plane and the wall are in the same vertical plane, more or less. Whereas it's not perfect in our case, but we have the planes are like that. Why do we want to do that? Well, it can be nice to have, a, to have a 3D model of your scene. Plus, what we want to do in this case is completely model the optics of the camera. And so we can not only change the exposure time, but change the focus and get infinite depth of field plus 3D structure. Okay? And that's, that's important for many applications. If you have very close views, they will be out of focus. Um, and this is very challenging for the 3D part because the, the, the motions are minuscule. All right, I, I think I don't have time to get into the details. Uh, yeah, so, ne next, so we have raw images, but a lot, a lot of applications, you don't have access to raw images. You want the, the, the JPEG images, so you need to, to, to deal with this. It's very complicated because what your camera does to the raw image is abominable. It, it fuses multiple pictures in a way it doesn't tell you which one. And this way of fusing, it will fuse a different number of pictures at each pixel. And then at the end, it does gamma correction and all that stuff, but much worse than gamma correction, horrible things. Okay, and so the noise models for, for JPEG image, it's not the compression so much, it's the, the even for the sRGB image, the, 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 the noise models are horrible. Um, and then again, as I was saying, we're working, I hope in a week or two, we'll have it running on, on the smartphone. 
so we created a, a small startup. There's five of us uh, on top. This me, that's Bruno Lequat, our, our PhD student who just graduated. Julia Meral, my colleague in uh, in Grenoble. So he's a machine learning and optimization person. I'm a computer vision person, so it's a good mix for the students. And this is um, our two new uh, new members. Uh, Long uh, just finished his PhD at NS Paris Saclay doing uh, super resolution for satellite imagery. So for us, it's perfect. And Maxime used to work for Xiaomi, which is a, a big uh, Chinese uh, phone, uh, smartphone maker. And so he's a specialist on that. So we have a very good team. We need to hire a couple more people. OK, let me switch gear completely. So how much time do I have until 120 or something? Oh, so I can slow down. You can ask me questions at any time if you want to. So I'm going to switch gear. I'm not going to be very technical. Yeah. Yes? If the recurring technique uh, one to one or one to many or many to many methods, that means one image per <coughs> So wait. So, 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 so there's, OK, so um, we do very little deep learning. I showed you an example of deep learning with the, 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 the tower. But this is complicated because if you change the focus, you, you need to calibrate completely the PSF for different focuses. So let's let's forget body brain for that thing. For the super resolution, it's a, it's a one too many without a regularizer, but it's almost a well posed problem. Almost because you have these um, multiple pictures. You have a single one is completely an ill posed problem here, and you are getting close, and then a regularizer, you know, closes the deal. Okay. Yeah. Is the underwater image? Underwater image. Underwater image is horrible. You have uh, you have all sorts of crap floating in the water. You have the index of refraction that changes. Uh, the, 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 the no, not as is, not as is. We we would have to change it. And, and I think we have other things to do before underwater. For example, astronomy. I will come back to that. All right. So. A couple of years ago, we, we, we met, Julia and I met some, some astronomers, and they were looking at, uh, at finding exoplanets. So we thought, wow. So we talked to them. So I don't know what you know about exoplanets and all that, so I'm going to give you a brief crash course in astronomy and exoplanets. So first, the planets of our solar system. So there used to be a ninth one, Pluto, but it's been downgraded to planetoid. So. And so you have the, the, the small rocky ones. That's the one that, like the Earth or Mars. And then you have the big giants. Um, and then what we would, what, what astronomers, they, are, they look at many things, but they look in, in particular at looking for exoplanets. Why? Because people would like to know whether there's, there's life somewhere else in the world. And, and, and another planet is a good spot to look for life. And now could you look for life on an exoplanet? If you can look at its atmosphere, and if you can see trace of water vapor in the atmosphere, for example, maybe there's a good sign there's life. Okay, so people have been looking hard for exoplanets. How do they look for exoplanets? So you, you might, this is the simplest method to, to explain, the, the best known one. So if, so planets rotate on a star in a plane called the ecliptic, and if the observer is not far from the ecliptic, from time to time, the, the planet will go in front of the star, and the brightness of the star will dim because there's, it's, a, it's a partial eclipse. So you look at stars, and if you see a periodic dimming of the star, it's a sign of the planet. So that, that's, that's it. I like this method a lot. This was actually, I think, the first exoplanet was found with that method, not the other one. So here is the idea. Again, imagine you are close to the plane of the ecliptic. What happens when the planet rotates around the star is that the star rotates a bit on the planet as well. OK? Not as much, but a little bit. And this rotation around the planet induces changes in radial velocity. The changes in radial velocity induce a shift, a Doppler shift in the spectrum of the star. So if you see the spectrum of your star shifting like this, that's a good sign there's a planet. Okay? Here is another one. That's the one we are working on. What you do is just look at the star. And so, of course, if you look at the star, you will be blind because the star is bright. So what you do is you put a little pupil in front of the star. It's called a coronagraph. And you induce uh, artificial eclipse. Okay? 
And so this is an, a, a real example of, uh, don't, the, the corona graph is the black dot here. Um, it's a real example of, of observation acquired over several years, many observations, all averaged out of a single star, and you can see the exoplanets rotating around it. This is a very favorable example and, and gathered for a long period of time, so you want to do better. To do this, you need big telescopes because you need enough resolution to see the planets, okay? So I will come back to what you can do about big telescopes in a minute. But this is an, an example of what the corona graph does. It's like an eclipse. When you go there, ah, the, the, the faint sources show up. It's like when you see the halo around the sun during a, a full eclipse, okay? All right, so here is a, a diagram of the, the exoplanets that have been discovered so far. Depending on the method, actually, I have no idea how microlensing works. I, I should look into it. But given multiple methods, including direct imaging. And so direct imaging, that's what we do, is the, 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 blue, the blue disk up there. What we are mostly interested in is rocky planets that are more likely to shelter life. But very few of these have been found by direct imaging. Why do you want to do direct imaging and not the other methods? Because the other methods don't tell you anything about the atmosphere. When you do direct imaging, you look at the color of the planet, you have a spectrum of the planet, it will tell you something about the atmosphere, that's what you want. So it's interesting to do, uh, to do it that way. Um, for this, you need a big telescope. The size of the telescopes you can put in space is limited by the, the size of the rockets that you can send in space. Okay? On Earth, you can, big as, you can build as big a telescope as you want. But... Earth, of course, is an atmosphere, and the atmosphere screws up with the light coming from the, from the, the star. Okay? In particular, it distorts the wavefront, the light wavefront. So because of that, I always repeat, I've not, I should check that my numbers are correct, but I've always read that because of that, the, um, the, the, the effective diameter of a telescope for resolution is limited to about 12 inches. Normally, if there was no atmosphere, the spatial resolution would be proportional to the diameter of the mirror. But because of the atmosphere, bad luck. So people have been work building big telescopes for a long time, but they build the big telescope not for resolution, for um, detecting faint objects. But in the 90s, people started, um, started developing uh, adaptive optics um, uh, gizmos for the telescope. What's the idea is you are going to, the light comes to your telescope, there is your main mirror, part of the thing goes to your, your camera, but part of it is diverted to a wavefront sensor that's going to measure or screwed up your wavefront is. And behind the telescope, behind the mirror, you have little actuators that deform in real time the mirror like a membrane. So that the wavefront, instead of being all screwy, becomes flat. Okay, and so here are some examples. This is those are pictures of N Neptune. I don't know which, uh, not not sure which telescope took it, but it's Earth-based telescope, a Bell telescope in space, Earth-based telescope with adaptive optics. So you don't get the same resolution as you'd have, you know, in, in, in deep space, but you get almost theoretical resolution. So because of that, people have been building big telescopes, and by big I mean really big. Oh, before I show you the really big telescope, there's one more thing you can do, is that uh, you, you probably know that if, if you look at the sky, and if you, if, if you, if you did time-lapse pictures of the sky, the, the sky will appear to rotate around the North Star. It's because of the rotation of the Earth. Okay? Well, you can take advantage of that. So you can do is take a picture of the star. With its pl the star is yellow, the planet is... Oops, sorry. The planet is blue, then you wait a little bit, take another picture, you take with, uh, a bit, uh, not a picture, and the star will have appeared to rotate, and the planet will have rotated around it. But you, astronomers, they know everything, so you know all these motions. So you can take all the pictures of the star to the même spot, and then you can derotate the planets. And that way, you can, you can put all the planets in the same spot and average out the, the halo. So that's the key part as well. It's called ADI for angular differential imaging. So now for the big telescopes. The data 
We have used in our experiments so for the very large telescope in the Tacoma Desert in Chile. I think it's around, I think it's at five or 6,000 meters altitude in the desert, so it's very good for looking at the sky. So it's, it's, it's pretty big, 50 square meters, so it's seven meters wide. But they are building this guy. This guy has a mirror that's 30, 30 meters and some diameter. 30 meters is, I don't know, what is this, like 15 meters? Twice, twice this, it's ten stories, ten stories high. So they are building these giant things, giant, okay. And they are building a few others. They should see the, the ELT, the Extreme Large Telescope, which is also in the desert in in uh, in Chile. Should see first light, supposedly in 2027, maybe a bit later, okay. But with this, you are going to see a lot of stuff in the sky. All right. So what do we do? So what we do is very simple, nothing to be proud of. I mean, I shouldn't say that because of my students and collaborators, but it's very, very simple. So the, the, this telescope uh, observes a sequence of images, and remember, the, the, the planets appear to rotate. This is a close-up of the halo rendered in false color, and you have, here you have two faint sources circled in red in one of the images, and they look, so the, the halo is, uh, is called the speckles in astro astronomy lingo, and uh, the source of the planets, they look like the speckles. They're the same optical characteristic. And what do they look like? They look like the PSF of the telescope. And the PSF of the telescope, you can measure by either shining a laser in the sky, which uh, my understanding is they don't do much, but rather by looking at, um, at a star nearby. Okay? And so they look a lot like, like it. And, um, and what are the characteristics of the speckles? So you have two slices of this cube of data. Um, and those are, those are the two sources. And uh, here, here comes the, two, the, 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 the temporal slices of this data. And the sources are going to appear to rotate, whereas the speckle that's linked to the instrument, not to the sky, is going to, be remain, to remain stationary, quasi-static. OK, so spatially, it's not quasi-static at all, but temporally, it remains about the same. All right, so what we are going to do is we are going to use the fact that it's quasi static to average out the, 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 the speaker as much as we can. And because we know that the, the planets are rotating, we can undo that rotation and, 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 and uh, proceed from there. This is the image formation model. The patch that you observe will be, the, it's, a, it's an additive model, the sum of the speckle plus the sum of the contributions of all the sources. The contribution of each source is the PSF of the camera times the intensity of the source times the rotation operator. Okay, so you can take advantage of that. We can um, say, yes, yeah, so of course we don't have many positive examples. So what you do is exactly like in image processing thing, we are going to create synthetic examples. But we have a very good image formation model. You know, the, the, the synthetic stars are really going to look like stars. So you can do that. Uh, have the good model. And a, a problem that's a real pain is that you may have false negative because there will be exoplanets where you don't know they are. That's why you are looking for them. And so it's, it's, it's a machine, supervised machine learning problem where you may have false negative. So it's complicated. Um, so to do that, you are going to, we shuffle the, the frames uh, during training, so you lose the spatial coherency, and so you, the, 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 um, the, the images will not look like they are, they are, they are going to be um, subject to the rotation that we know. Um, there also a difficulty is how to evaluate the results because we don't have ground truth. So of course we are going to do what the astronomers do, is they, sim they evaluate the results in synthetic data. Okay? But in the end, you want to, to, to detect true exoplanets, so you want to, to, to make a decision. But astronomers are ready to go back and make more observations confirm. Or you can have uh, observations at several different times, and then that, that will tell you that you have found real, real stars. So this is, the, this is going to, up, to appear. It's been accepted, I don't know when it will appear, in the monthly notice of the Royal Astronomical Society. It's called DIPACO. We use a simple statistical model, a simple statistical model of the speckle called PACO, developed by the, the main author Olivier Flesser, um, and to average out the average out the, the speckle, we whiten the patches by averaging them, and we do that before the rotating. So at each pixel, at most, you will have one source. You won't have a source, you know, everywhere. Um, then we derotate so that the source will be aligned. 
And then we do a, we do a unit and we do a, we do supervised classification. It's regression right, in this case. Okay, so it's very simple. How does it work? So evaluated and, and synthetic data in green. That's who we are. The rest are state of the art methods, and this is a so-called contrast curve. And contrast curve, you want to be as low as possible. And the theoretical limit is, in, you can estimate, is the, the dotted line. So we are doing pretty well. We have not found exoplanets yet. We have found one new source that, because the distance from the star is characteristic, is probably the brown dwarf or background star, but it's a new source. We need to make a bigger experiment. You can also try to estimate the flux of the star, the intensity of the star, or the spectrum. This is important if you look for signs of life, and again, with simple deep learning method, you can get very good results. And you can, this was in black and white if you want, but you have multispectral imagery as well, and this allows you to um, um, disambiguate your results. This is the latest thing we have obtain, obtained. Um, what is difficult is when you are very close to the star and when th there's not much rotation of the, of the planet. Okay, and so what we have done is, is um, generalize a bit our method for essentially two things. One, we use ensembling to get better classification results, and that that that, that adds a lot. And two, um, we uh, use multiple observations, which is very important because before that our method was one training for one star, and you cannot do a large scale experiment like this. And so, and what. Uh, the region in this curve that the astronomers care about is the one with almost no false negative, no false positive, rather, and this is there. And you can see the, the blue thing makes a difference there for very small rotation, very close to the star. Next, what we are going to do is we, um, we don't like so much the fact that you, know, you are just doing CNN and whatever. What we would like to do is something like source separation with true statistical model for the speckle and for the star. We have started looking at it using um, uh, diffusion processes, which I think are quite appropriate. We experience will tell us, but are appropriate here because the speckles look a lot like texture. They have relatively simple structure. Experience will tell us. What's next? And why do we want to do this, this, this diffusion stuff as well? It's because the, um, it's good, I have plenty of time. I can show you videos at the end. Uh, is that, um, there are extended objects up there that we can see. So around young stars, you have so-called so circumstellar disks. They are disks made of de debris and dust in which planets are born. So those are actual observation, a circumstellar disk around some, some stars. These were done by Olivier Flasser. Again, not, not with me, but uh, with, uh, before. And so we want to get better results on this, improve the resolution and all that. So that's what we're going to do next. I put this picture because I love this picture more than anything else. I think it's very pretty. It's from the James Webb Telescope. It's a picture of Neptune and its rings. And so we would like to do super resolution for that. Again, the astronomers know everything. They know the rotation of the, of the planets. They know anything. So we can align these things and all that. And it would be nice to get you know, higher resolution uh, pictures from this. this. So this we might do. I think there's a chance we'll do it. This, eh, but this thing is one of my, I don't know, have you heard about the dimming of Betelgeuse? So Betelgeuse is a red giant. And so in, in, in the universe, the only things we resolve are within the solar system, except for these circumstellar disks and also galaxies and things like that. But a star is a point. It doesn't look like a point because there's a PSF the telescope, but it's a point. You don't get details. Betelgeuse is big enough and close enough that they manage to take pictures that are about five pixels uh, across. And so what's the big dimming of Betelgeuse? So in two, 2019, astronomers were looking at Betelgeuse and they, they discovered that, that it, it was becoming less bright, it was dimming. And they thought that it was a sign that it would explode. So they were worried because astronomers will worry about this kind of stuff. But then they took this kind of imagery, which is resolved. You can see details. And you can see that, the, for example, the dimming is on the right, right part here. 
and now they have resolved the problem, they have solved the problem. They are, the current hypothesis is that uh, Betelgeuse ejected a lot of matter, and then it came back, fell back on the thing, and that's what dimmed dim the image. But can you imagine if you could super resolve this? That would be, I think that would be pretty nice. All right, what we are going to do next um, is we are going to look at um, molecular microscopy. So I don't know if you have heard of molecular microscopy. Each of these dots is a molecule. So you take uh, living tissue, so a piece of cell, and you shine a laser on it. As the laser shines on it, some molecules will phosphoresce. They will light up. Then you turn off the laser, you do it again. Some other molecules will light up. And you do it a thousand times, you'll get this kind of pictures. How do you improve the resolution? How do you get better pictures, more details in this thing? And there are, there are biologists looking at it. So we are lucky enough that we have an bio, in-house biologist you want in our AI Institute, because Jean-Baptiste Masson is working on this, so we are going to work on it with him. Also, we, we hope we will work with, um, with a guy in Sophie Antipolis uh, called Luca, Calatroni, I think, um, because shining, shining light on, on live, live specimen is not good because after a while, it, you kill the specimen. So instead, what you can do is you can take like a video of the specimen, and there will be some natural fluorescence with fluctuations, and you can use that to try to reconstruct the molecule. So we are going to look that, uh, at that as well. Okay, so that's just a blah, blah. Uh, that's more blah, blah. Um, I want to spend, so this part of the talk has nothing to do with the rest, but I think the results are interesting. So, um, so we have this very good student, again, uh, Guillaume Lemoyne, he's working with Carl Lillian and me, and he's doing video prediction. Video prediction is a bizarre thing, because how can you predict the future? So you do machine learning, and you predict the future, but uh, what will you get? Okay. So the, the way he does it, I'm going to play a bit, a, a bit of the video. The way he does it, he has the, the, the key part is that he's going to represent some of the objects of video. This is, for those of you who know um, shape context, this is related to shape context. You, you have a deformable grid around the objects, and you, and so that, that does, you are, it's decomposing the, the video into layers, and then uh, predicting the motion of these few points, and then you can get pretty good results. So let me try to show you. Uh, I don't know if I will manage. I don't have my glasses, so that, that's the overview. That's the layer decomposition. That's the prediction. I want to I'm putting everything together. Okay, and here is some uh, some results. So Waldo is our method, and you see the kind of thing that it does. So you take four frames in a video, you predict 20 frames in the future, which is crazy. And so, but it gives reasonable results. It's not perfect, huh? but the, the car turns. And if you compare it, so it's a mixture of, you know, having good in painting, deforming this stuff and all that, but I wanted to show you the, uh, okay, that, that's the comparison with our methods. And at the end, we show you the ground truth of what is really in the thing. And that works pretty well. A lot of the method things stop moving in most of the method, and, uh, but it works pretty well. And then I want to show you, we tried something crazy. It's uh, predict 50 frames in the future from four. And that's, that's, not, that's not something one should do. But we were curious, so we did it. Oh, uh, also, it works very well for non-rigid motions. So this is us on the left and right, the, 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 the best competition. And I think what is more interesting is when you see the, there's some, some alterophile, alterophile, I don't know you call it. It's not perfect, of course, but compared to competition, it's pretty good. Um, yeah, and that's the best the state of the art on the right. Okay, so now let's try to do some long-term prediction. There we go. So the slump is the only other method that will do long-term prediction, and they get the car terms. I mean, I, was, I, I don't understand. 
And you should never do that. You should really never do that. You could, should only do that if some supervisory signal for the future. So one of the things we want to do is video compression. The other things we want to do is you, you take, a, you see 20 episodes of a cartoon series, and I give you a new episode, and it give you the first five frames and the script. And the script will give you supervisory thing to the end. And, and the thing we really want to do is video compression in the end. All right. And so the last thing that I think is pretty good, this is a very, very simple method. We, it's an archive. You, I can let you imagine where we sent it. Um, it's about trying to, to, um, to, to, to densely track all the points in an image, all the points. And there are people who do dense stuff with optical flow, but it's not tracked over the whole image. There are people who track individual points, but we do both. And the method is so simple that I don't want to tell you. But I will try to show you some examples. Uh, so this is what people do. So in a relatively sparse bunch of tracks, we track every point. And it deals with occlusion. It's fast and quite simple. I'll show you some creative examples, and I will show you comparison. You can track the airplanes and get all that stuff. Let me see what the 138.39. And there will be some comp comparison with other computing method. It can deal with very complex motions. Huh? OK. So this is the state of the art methods. And uh, they are, this, this shows you where. So when it puts the, the white uh, crosses, it's when it thinks there's occlusion. And it keeps on tracking. The other methods don't keep on tracking. It deals with occlusion, doesn't that crap. Um, if you're interested, look, up, uh, look at uh, Guillaume's, um, Guillaume's uh, uh, website, and, and you'll, you'll find the paper and, and the videos. All right, so I have one more minute. So if anybody is interested in theoretical robotics, come talk to me. Uh, I don't know if you know anything about robotics or about motion planning. I haven't seen theoretical work in motion planning for 20 years. And I have a very good student called um, uh, Yann dubois Montmarin, worked with uh, the late Jean-Paul Lomont and, and myself on, on, on the following problem. How can I define a good, a good metric structure on general robotic configuration spaces. So a robot, like a polyarticulated robot. But here, what we call a robot is just a deformi deformable shape with constant volume. So uh, a robotic arm is a robot like that. It doesn't change volume. Okay? And we don't make any other assumption that any deformable thing, we don't, no parametrization, nothing, and, uh, but, but constant volume. Well, then what you can show that if you take two configurations, two of instance of deformable volume, and you take all possible paths separating them, continuous paths separating them, the volume as it deforms will sweep a figure. And this is in the plane here, but this is in arbitrary space. There's no, there's no constraint at all. And what's very easy to show is that if you take the minimum of all paths of the swept volume, minus the initial volume, this defines a true distance symmetric, uh, non-negative, uh, triangular inequality, and all that, which is pretty nice. And it's very easy to show in self-theoretical ways. It's, it's very simple. The bad thing about it, I might bore you because I don't know if you care about robotics. Um, the bad thing about it is that the self-theoretical stuff, if you sweep the same volume twice, it's only counted once. That's what is illustrated here. And that's not good because what we want to do is compute geodesic, shortest paths for these robots. But because this thing is swept several times counted once, you can go back and forth and it won't change the swept volume. So this simple thing doesn't work. To make it work, you need to go with, come up with a differential version of this. How you can have an um, uh, incremental description of the swept volume. And there you, you avoid that thing because the volume, the things swept several times will be counted several times. And then you can show that you have a distance again. 
you can show that distance and miss geodesics, and you can compute those geodesics. And that's a lot harder to prove than that. Why would you do that? Eh, because it's interesting. Is it useful? I don't know. <laughs> Here are some examples, though. This is an implementation in 2D of a, a robot. This is, um, on the top, you have the shortest path between two configuration compute by the usual uh, Riemannian uh, metric and configuration space. And on the bottom, you have what we get. So what's interesting is, of course, and you have the total swept volume. And of course, our structure gets a smaller volume. Why do you want that? Because you are less likely to hit obstacles if you sweep a smaller volume. Okay? But what's really interesting is this. To go from this configuration to that, you rotate, and you go straight, you rotate again. It turns out that in a control theory, there's, there's something called turnpikes for certain optimal control problems. The optimal solution will be close to a stationary solution of your original optimal control problem. So that means when you, when, you, when you compute the optimal solution, there'll be a little bit of wiggle at both ends, but most of the time, you will be on this prototypical trajectory. This, is, this seems to be what we observe here. This is not an optimal control problem. This is a geodesic computation problem. So we have to adapt the thing. So where we are now, we know to define the property we want. The, the, the role of time in optimal control here is replaced by the length of a path. So you want that for most of the length of any optimal trajectory, you be close to a prototype. Um, we need the characterization of the turnpike of the stationary solution, and then we need to show that you spend most of your time there. So do we need to show that? We haven't done that yet. Uh, we have started talking to um, Emmanuel Trella, who is the big boss of turnpikes. And, uh, and the interesting thing with that, because it gives you prototypical, simple trajectories. If you have this, maybe you can build a dictionary of simple trajectories and do motion planning with this and maybe learn to do motion planning or whatever. But we still don't know if it's useful or not, but it's, uh, it's kind of a mixture of uh, classical mechanics and differential geometry and a bit of optimal control. So for people who are theoretically inclined, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's good. And I will stop there, and I, uh, I hope I've not been too long. Here are some publications. If you want, I can send you the slides, the publications, and some references. And I will stop there, and I thank you for your attention. Yes. So for the for the solution, uh, you're showing the working images. Have you been use, uh, done this uh, for video and also? No, because we same thing. We need <coughs> getting <coughs> the raw frames of the video is, is is usually you don't get those. But we 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 could, and also we um, from with videos you, you often may have uh, motion blur. We don't know how to deal with motion blur yet. But of course. We want to do videos uh, because it's a big application. So applic our applica the applications we are looking at so far for the startup are uh, photography for smartphones, uh, scientific photography, and what's talking about cosmetology and all that. You want not, not to make pretty pictures, but you get the real wrinkles, the real stains, the real hair. Um, and then all the people, we want, want to improve their pictures for further processing, be it for e-commerce or for whatever. Uh, defense, why not? We don't want to do, um, we don't want to do uh, face super resolution because I don't want to know any of that, that stuff. Plus, it, from a pragmatic point of view, it's, it's too, much, too, too much trouble. But there are, there are millions of applications, and so JPEG and videos are very important for those. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's what we want to do. So what we want to do is we take a video, and we are going to compress, and we are going to predict. But we'll have the tra you have the supervisory thing because we have the original video. Yep, that's what we want to do, and that's a big, 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 big application, of course. Yeah, that's what we want to do. So we don't know. We haven't done it. We are supposed to do the, the next step after, after the, 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 the prediction was supposed to be a paper about compression. But then the tracking thing was pretty exciting. So we put it on back burner. But we definitely want to do compression, of course. So whether this method can also be used for autocar? For what? Autocar. 
Ah, for the cars, driving cars? Yeah. Of course. Okay. So, so again, I think for, for, for long-term prediction, you need supervisory signal. But for cars, you do. You have maps, for example. So use that. Yeah, sure, sure. Of course, of course. Yes? Yeah. Actually, in that problem, and then uh, forward model to solve this. Um, and then you talk a little bit about uh, machine learning in terms of regularization. Um, and I wanted to, uh, to ask you uh, your experience when actually this machine learning deep learning is actually useful. Because when I, when, when I listen, it, look, it looks like um, uh, you are not. No, no, I do, I do, I do. The, uh, so, so I would say uh, maybe uh, Julien and Bruno would disagree with me, but I would say seventy percent of the job is done by the, the model and the inverse problem sol solution, and the thirty percent is that you want the pictures in the end to look like natural pictures, and the regularization make a huge difference. So, otherwise, you will have artifacts everywhere. The colors will be all screwed up. There will be. No, I think it's really important. But but it's not not the only, it's not the only ingredient or maybe even the main yes, ingredient. Yes, so because now people think that everything is data and less models. Well, that so I hate. So I know I know I know and I, I know what I will have, what we expect when we write these papers and I will say yeah. And in, in, in our, in, 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 from a pragmatic point of view, empirical point of view, in our case, uh, it works better than any other method we have, we have tested. So of course, we don't have access to anything. The, the fund manufacturers don't give, our, give us their software. The only one that publishes this stuff is Google. But the experiments we have done, I think, so work better. Um, and uh, one, thing, one thing also that, that's not satisfactory at all in what we do is that we use synthetic pictures to train our data. So what we would like to do is to do self-supervised training. But self-supervised training, you know, if you just, pre just train your thing to predict the image, it's severely ill-posed and it will drive the regularizer to zero. So the thing we are going to do now, we are hope to have an intern to do it now, is uh, adversarial self-supervised training, which I think should work like a charm. We shall see. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of training data and so forth. What, what is your take? Can we, can we, can we sort of marry the two? That, that's what we are trying to do, right? We are trying to do, we are, we, are, we, are, we are trying to use the, when you have good models, it's like when people try to, to I hope I don't offend anyone, there are people who try to learn robot kinematics. Why the heck would you do that? You build a robot, you know its kinematics. And so when you, have, when, you, when you can be fairly sure about your, and of course the models are never perfect, but when you are fairly sure about your models, use those models as much as you can, leave a bit of leeway for the, the learning, and then there are things where the learning itself, can, again for the self-supervised, the learning itself can be very useful. But so I think personally in my heart, that may, I may be wrong, but I think black box models are, are bad because also one of the things you need to do, you, 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 in, in scientific applications, you want to have some measure of certainty. You want to calibrate your, your machine learning thing. When I look at classic, I don't look at classification paper, they bore me nowadays, but uh, they, don't, they don't do any calibration. The, 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 the thing source a number, uh, source outputs a number between zero and one, and this is probability. It's not serious. So we, we, I think having a proper statistical model, so doing things the right way, to me, is the good, the good way to do. After that, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe a big, big black box. And also, okay, but also there's something is that you cannot, the, the, do we really want, I mean, I love LLMs like everybody else, for example. Do you really want to train your stuff on hundred billions of zillions of gazillions of stuff? And, and, you know, and warm the planet quite a bit in the process. Do we want to do that? Or do we want to have models that can be trained from relatively little data and not just by huge, uh, huge tech giants? So I think there's a, 
I mean, no, I'm all for I'm all in favor of learning, but I, I think there's there's in this in these problems that are well defined where we have good physical models, there's plenty of room for mixing the models with the learning. Yeah, I know. Like, well, I just have my fire linguist, my uh, blah blah. Hey, I don't know anything about NLP. To me, uh, okay, I'm going to be very pretentious. Um, I apologize for that in advance. I'm tired. So there's a book by Leonardo da Vinci called uh, Perspective or something like that, or Essays on Perspective. And it's not at all about geometric perspective. It's about uh, paintings and all that. And what he says is that. Uh, I'm sorry, it's pretentious. But he says that painting is, is, a, is a higher form of art than poetry, because uh, poet, poetry, you can only understand at a single level. Not exactly a single level, but multiple levels, but not so many. A picture, you enter in it, and you go into infinitely, right? You have, you have, you have a series of level details. So I think images are more. But I don't know anything about NLP, but I think images, to me, appear more complicated complicated objects, and plus, even though grammars are apparently not a very good model of real language, the vocabulary seems to be pretty much, I, maybe I'm wrong, but the vocabulary seems pretty much. What the hell is the vocabulary we have in our, in our, in our visual uh, system? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows either, or they haven't told me if they know. So I think images are complicated. But maybe, maybe we'll find out that it, everything is very prototypical in images, too, and you can, I don't know. And, and for example, so I've told some of you, for example, I, the, 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 I don't care so much of, about synthesizing you know, cool pictures, but nonetheless, the, if you look at the diffusion models, when they are combined with LMs and they do compose, compose images in strange ways, not, not the fact that the images are realistic, but they are composed, you know, astronaut and a horse. That, that to me is very intriguing and, and remarkable. I apologize for the uh, pretentious stuff. And you, you must be exhausted. Any other question? Then thank you very much. <laughs>